Moving on to our first speaker on the opposition, we have Jordan Scott. Uh, Jordan is a first year student reading for an MPhil in philosophy at Wolfson College. Um, Jordan also won the slot through open audition. Uh, Jordan, the floor is yours. Thank you all uh, so much for having me here. Uh, obviously, I feel very privileged and more than a little terrified, you know, speaking alongside uh, such an excellent panel. Um, I think Frug's, of course, right to highlight some of the, you know, the issues that have plagued our society historically and still do to this day, and, you know, the immense suffering that people have endured through racial violence. However, uh, forgive me, I do seem to fail to see the exact relevance of this to the, you know, the question at hand of, you know, should people, and let's be honest, the question implicitly, you know, implies white people, stop talking about race and start listening instead. And I'm not entirely sure why we should think this. I mean, yes, there are issues of societal ignorance, but I fail to see why ignorance should motivate us to stop having conversations. Quite the opposite, I think. And one of the best things about, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement has been that it's, you know, forced people who are otherwise ignorant of, you know, uh, racial issues to have to consider them for the first time ever. So my argument um, broadly is going to be in uh, two parts. Uh, the first, where well, I just argue for what I hope is a fairly, you know, uncontroversial uh, opinion that we just shouldn't be writing off people's value in a conversation or making negative value judgments about people based on their racial background. The second is a more pragmatic uh, point that, you know, this focus on listening at the expense of talking just doesn't work because listening isn't our goal. Our goal is to convince people, not just to have people listen uh, in a vacuum. Uh, so to the first part. So it's becoming, it's becoming increasingly trendy to have this view that, um, you know, white people should essentially shut up, you know, they should you know, listen to, you know, the views of people who are not white, but they themselves shouldn't, you know, contribute into the conversation. And this is usually done on the assumption um, that without having experienced racism, they, you know, they won't have any value in their judgments. They can't speak well or valuably. Um, so, firstly, I want to say that I don't think this is entirely true, but more importantly, I want to argue that even if it was true as a general statistic, it wouldn't justify this kind of stance. So, um, you know, this assumption that um, because white people lack experiences of racism, you know, they can't have valuable opinions is nonsense because at the level of experience, we're all ignorant of racism. We all need to acknowledge how broad, you know, racial issues are, how, you know, many forms of racism there are, and they affect each one of us differently. Sure, it can be useful to kind of shoehorn them together into groups uh, to highlight, for example, the difference between tendencies in the way, you know, black men are treated uh, as opposed to black women, um, you know, issues in, say, the black LGBT community, and issues between, you know, black racism, Asian racism, and all these other varieties. But even these are, you know, broad, rough categories that, you know, um, are just the conglomeration of many, many individual experiences. At the level of experience, we all know very little. And to gain actual knowledge about racism to make, and to make good conversation, we need to go out and seek out other people's opinions, reflect on what we've heard, and think hard and reason well. And this is something that white people are perfectly capable of, even if maybe they don't have the same, you know, or there's a tendency to not have the same motivation. Sure, I'm interested in race because of my own experiences, and I'm sure uh, for many people be in similar situations, but it doesn't mean that white people don't also feel a motivation to learn and that they can't have good opinions too. But, you know, let's take, let's uh, assume for the moment there was some statistical generalization that white people on the whole uh, just knew less, you know. Would this justify this notion that white people should stop talking and start listening? No, I don't think so. I think it, if we've learned one thing from the history of racism, it's that it's wrong to um, take a statistical claim about a group and use it to, to draw judgments about individuals. I mean, consider like, a couple of uh, examples. I mean, this one isn't even related to race. Imagine... Um, say, a mechanic, in possession of a statistic that, for the sake of argument, will say is true, um, that, say, women on the whole know less about cars than men. A female customer walks in uh, to the shop, and they assume, oh, this is a woman, she doesn't know anything about cars, and then perhaps proceeds to, you know, overcharge her or talk patronizingly. Now, we can see that clearly something has gone wrong here, even if the statistic was true, which I'm not saying it is, but even if it was, he'd still be committing, you know, a wrong in, you know, reasoning from this claim about a group to judging this individual. Uh, we get the same thing when it comes to race. I remember a few years back, um, a story going around about kind of a conductor for an orchestra that said they kind of, um, you know, uh, looked worse upon, you know, black applicants, uh, black musicians, because their families, I think they argued, just tended not to have the same respect for classical music, and so they were on the whole worse. And clearly this is nonsense, and clearly this is wrong. 
And it's important to note that it would be wrong even if there was some true generalization that black families cared less about classical music. It's just kind of not the point. It's not what we should be focusing on. We just shouldn't be making these judgments based on statistics. So this is why it's just generally wrong to be acting this way, to be talking about white people as individuals and saying you shouldn't do this because of some broad statistic about your group. Right, so now onto my uh, more like pragmatic point. We're just listening is not the point. As much as it sounds nice on the surface, it sounds great. Oh yeah, we should just listen more. That will solve everything. But we don't want people to just listen. We want people to be convinced. We want people to have, um, you know, unreasonable, badly thought out views, to trade them in for good views, for open-minded views, you know, for, you know, views that will benefit society. And how do we convince people? Well, two ways, I think. Firstly, through exposure to new views. We consider opinions we hadn't considered before. And secondly, through, you know, realizing our own mistakes, realizing the flaws in our own views and correcting them. And this, I, I argue, is the most crucial bit. Firstly, because it can happen independently of whether you're exposed to new views. And secondly, because exposure to new views largely works to convince you because it makes you do the second. It makes you realize where you've gone wrong. But merely listening doesn't get us the second. It doesn't get us to, you know, correct our own mistakes because we don't, you know, necessarily get this cognitive dissonance, this idea that there's a clash that motivates us to change. Two things tend to happen if you only listen to someone else's view, right? Either you hear the view, broadly agree with it and go, yeah, yeah, sounds nice enough. And then just go back to thinking exactly what you already thought. You haven't actually experienced any meaningful change. You haven't taken in the view, compared it to your own, and done the analysis to change your own problematic beliefs. Um, this is very common, especially among people that are, you know, less introspective. And let's be honest, most of the people we most need to convince on issues of race are probably not the most introspective people in the world. The people that hold the most bigoted views, the people that really need to be doing a bit more listening, as well as, I think, engaging in these conversations, are often the ones that don't very well apply new concepts. So it's even more important that we get them to lay their cards on the table so they can see where these problems lie. Um, yeah, so... The second thing that tends to happen if um, you merely listen is you might just write off a view completely as wrong. It's, it's very easy to do. We're all biased towards our own views. It's very easy to hear something we hadn't heard before and go, yeah, but it's different to what I think, so I'm just going to keep believing what I think. It's very easy to, you know, believe you're right until you actually have to prove it, until you actually have to have a conversation with someone and try and form your view into a reasonable and persuasive way. Until then, sure, we think we're right all the time. I think I'm right about loads of things that probably I'm wrong about. Until I actually have a conversation with someone who, you know, knows something about it and I have to actually express why I'm right, that's when I'll realize I'm wrong. And that's when I'll realize my argument is full of holes and, you know, just not persuasive at all. So, by encouraging people to speak, you know, to express their views, to engage in conversations about race, um, we get them to, we, you know, we help in three ways. It lets them see the flaws in their own arguments. It allows them to see, oh, hold on, maybe this view isn't as robust as I thought. Or it allows them to see, oh, hold on, this is where my opponent's view conflicts with mine and their case seems better. It allows them to, you know, do that sort of thing. It lets their opponents in the argument see how best to try and convince them. You know, laying their cards on the table lets the opponent say, well, that's where your argument's weak. There's the problem right there. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, it lets the bystanders, the people watching, the people hearing these conversations, hear and see and judge themselves which arguments are bad and which arguments are good and why they should believe reasonably as opposed to, you know, believing based on, you know, badly thought out, you know, uh, you know, bigoted, terrible arguments. And so these are the three reasons why we should have people speaking, not just listening, and listening completely misses the point. So, you know, to wrap up, it's not just, for example, white allies that ought to be talking about race, it's everyone. You know, if you think you have a view on race, you should go out and get it challenged, right? You should express it. Obviously do so with tact and understanding that not every black person, for example, wants to talk about race all the time. If we're just enjoying a few drinks, maybe we don't want to engage in incredibly serious conversation about the racial, you know, issues in our society. But being able to, where it's appropriate, have these conversations, express your views, and not being afraid to be wrong. Not being afraid uh, to admit, I may well have, you know, some problems in my view, Perhaps talking to you will help bring them to light, and then I can reflect on it. Because that's how we get meaningful change in people. And so that's why we should not uh, be telling people to stop speaking and start listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jordan.